into space. Again, technologies that were developed for other purposes now being applied to rice science. And what's really exciting about that is we get a very fine estimate of where rice is grown and when it's planted. We used to depend on satellite imagery using reflected light as our source of, of, of imagery for where rice was being grown. But those of you who are familiar with monsoonal rice production know that during most of the year, if you use satellite imagery, you get beautiful pictures of clouds. It doesn't help you very much. I mean, they're pretty, okay. You all like to look out the middle of the plane. But it um, doesn't help you very much. But now we're using satellite uh, radar imagery, which penetrates clouds and also can take a picture at night or during the daytime. It doesn't matter. And we can see through the clouds, we can get a very accurate information of the rice area. And just because of the different signals of water and soil and plant, we can tell exactly when a field was planted at just a few meters resolution. And so now we're getting images around Asia, over millions of hectares, telling us exactly what is being grown and how it's being grown and how it's doing. We're able now to tell, two months before harvest, and give very accurate estimates of what we can expect the yield to be. Ground truthing that, we're ranging from 85 to 96% accuracy in our yield estimates, depending on whether it's a late storm hits or something. That's a phenomenal amount of information available to our policymakers. That will transform how they look at rice policies, how rice trade takes place. And we're taking these information, putting them together to create national rice information, global rice information gateways, assembling very sophisticated tools that we have been developing for 30 years, putting them together so that we can have real-time estimates of what's happening in the world, so that our policymakers at least will have good information. They still may make bad decisions, but they won't make bad decisions because they have bad information. Extremely important. Now, I talked that we're having a second green revolution. I gave you the starting minute. I believe we should be thinking about the third green revolution now. We don't want to wait 45 years between green revolutions. We prepare the foundations now. We're looking to transform the basic machinery of the rice plants and improve its fundamental relationships with the environment. We're redesigning photosynthesis. This could increase rice yield by 50%, increase our nitrogen use efficiency and water use efficiency. It is taking the less developed photosynthesis of rice and turning it into the very much more efficient photosynthesis that we see in maize and, and, and sugar cane. To our knowledge, it's the only biological mechanism that exists that can improve yields at this, to this degree. We're also beginning to address nitrogen fixation. Can we create rice crops that will take nitrogen from the atmosphere and produce their own fertilizer? We look at the wild relatives of rice. Before evolutionary time, these were isolated from rice. We have an area our scientists have broken down the barrier and can cross our wild relatives into our domesticated rice variety and pull that into the breeding programs. This work, all of this work, will require great partnerships, bringing the best clients of the world together. Our C4 Rice Consortium is an example of that, but increasingly, with our global partnerships, we can create communities of the top thinkers, the top doers in plant science computer science, et cetera, to address our problems. So if we look at the Green Revolution series, Green Revolution 1 was basically built on a high-yield plant architecture adapted to low-stress environments. Our second Green Revolution incorporates tolerance to severe stresses, adds nutritional uh, uh, value, and I would like to say that it is a revolution in which no farmer is left behind. Green Revolution 1, justly criticized for benefiting only those farmers growing in relatively stress-free environments. Green Revolution 2, 
all farmers will benefit. Green Revolution 3 will accelerate the evolution of the rice plant itself. Will effectively be producing designer rice. And no arise of species will be left untapped. So we have before us a surge of new technologies, potential technologies, and these will benefit the rice community in ways that are unimaginable just a few years ago. We have a demand for these technologies. But how can we best reach our farmers? How can we best get our policymakers to understand? How can we best engage the private sector? We have increased risk of catastrophic losses. And we need to pre-adapt our rice production systems to these. And I believe we can do that. So I would like to close with an ancient Chinese saying, because the precious things are not pearls of jade, but the five grains in which, of course, rice is the finest. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome to the Fourth International Rice Congress, and thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. At this moment, I would like to call the Privy Council forward to the stage, please. Yes, Your Excellency, uh, Privy Counselor to the Royal Family, uh, as Dr. Tolentino mentioned, uh, Erie has been under patronage of the Royal Family uh, uh, for many years now. Many of us have had the great privilege to meet with His Royal Majesty the Prince and the Princess. And uh, at our very first board meeting, the Royal Family was represented in 1960 when Erie was founded. So I would like to present to you a token of our appreciation for the patronage of the Royal Family. And you can communicate them, uh, to them at your will. This is a series of photographs, and I would appreciate it if you would accept it on behalf of the Royal Family. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Privy Councillors, 